I want to share something. I shared this about 30 years ago, um, but I don't think you'll remember too much of it. And anyway, um, I've lived a lot of life and um, totally re-prepared the whole thing anyway. But it's something that a lot of people know. For some people, it's the only part of the Old Testament they do know. Um, and that is in First Chronicles chapter 4. Now, normally speaking, I doubt anybody has read chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and I don't know how many other chapters of Chronicles because it is just one long list after list after list of names. It is genealogies on top of genealogies. And um, it's not the sort of thing. Well, maybe if you're an insomniac, it's good reading. But um, what makes these verses so important is that right in the middle of all those genealogies, the, the scribe who was writing this stops and he gives us a mini history of this fellow and then returns to the genealogies. It's as if as he's writing the genealogies, he just cannot pass this one by. He could never just be a name in history and he has to stop and tell us just minimal, but tell us something of his life. I found that very fascinating. If you're, you're going to read nothing but names, and there's one name, it is impossible to pass up. And so it's a little difficult to put a date on it, but it's approximately taking place in the book of Judges. That's um, where the genealogies have reached, sort of. Uh, Possibly, what well, from here it would be about three and a half thousand years ago. Um, but in, in verse 9, um, he says, Jabez. Now, we, we've never met Jabez before. So he just, he's going to be one of those in this long list. But Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother named him Jabez. And the reason she named him Jabez, she said, because I bore him with pain. Now, Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my border, that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from harm, that it may not pain me. And God granted him what he requested. That's it. We're back to the list of names. And there, there he stands, right in the middle of it. Jabez, fascinating chap. You can't pass him over. And he only takes up, you know, a couple of verses. But those two verses engrave his name on history. And you have to say, what well, on earth was it with this man? that caused him to be engraved on history, that stood out above everybody else, that everybody else is just a name. But this one, he had to include at least some history, and that history was the key to his engraving his name on history. So let's jump in. It's a very strange scripture right from the gate, because it says his mother named him. And in that culture, mothers didn't name them. Uh, the husband did. A and also a name was not just merely a handle that you were called by. The, the name had tremendous importance. Usually um, it was a kind of prophecy that the parents gave it with a great sense of, of what God was saying. And so when they gave the name, it was a destiny. And as we've said before, they sound to us just, well, it's a sound, what else? Um, but that sound many times is a little sentence in the Hebrew language. And that sentence describes 
what the person desires and trusting their desire is hand in hand with God's desire, what, what this person is going to become. And within the sentence, a sort of pointer to their becoming what they believed it's God's destiny. And, and so naming was a big, big thing. It contained the hope of the parents for the child. And to the child, not only being called by a sound as we are, but remember it was a little sentence. And so when you called the child or anybody spoke to the child, they would name by that little sentence. And the sentence was drawing the child on to become their name. Their, their name was the guiding light. Their name was their magnetic north. This is where I'm going. This is who I am. And this is my God-given destiny. And so when his mother, I say again, weird, that the mother should be doing it. But when she named him, it was not a casual naming. It wasn't going through a, a book with a list of names. Now, this is something that was formed in her and she gives it to the child with intention that this name shall be the magnetic north that draws the child to its fulfillment. Um, where was the father? I, I have to ask that because it's so unusual. Had he died? Very possibly. Um, did he die around the time of the child's birth? Is that why she called him Jabez? Um, did he walk out on them? Had he abandoned mother and child before he was born? Or was he just a wimp who just said, yes, dear, and, and, and let the mother do everything? I don't know. That's one of the mysteries of this little bunch of verses. Um, but at his birth, at Jabez's birth, there was something that happened. Sorry, again, we're into I don't know. But something happened that gave the mother great pain. It, 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 uh, sorrow seemed to, to get inside of her very life. And, and it was a pain and a sorrow that she could not handle. She didn't know what to do with it. And in her grief, she gave it to her newborn child. That, that is something we're all very good at. If, if you have a pain, pass it on. And, and um, some people, they're mad at you and they scream at you, but they're really in pain themselves. And, um, well, this, this lady, she gave the child the name of pain and sorrow, which is the meaning of Jabez. She gave her newborn baby her pain and said, I name you pain and sorrow, as if it was his fault. And, and worse than that, naming it meant that became the child's magnetic north. This is his destiny, this to which he is being drawn. So the focus of his life would be sorrow, sorrow to himself, but also sorrow to all those that were unfortunate enough to live around him. Um, it's imprinted into him. I really want you to hear this. This is not just a curiosity. This is massive. Um, it was imprinted into him as if she put inside of the child, you are responsible for all the pain that I'm experiencing in my life. All the pain of this family, your response. I should never have birthed you. You're an accident. You brought me sorrow. You'll always bring me sorrow. I name you. I imprint you pain and sorrow. <sighs> what chance does this kid have? Um, you, you could say he was a man broken from birth. You know, just being alive, he's broken with a name that is a lie. It's a lie. The whole name is a lie. He is not responsible. 
but he doesn't know that. Children do not edit. We're children up until I don't know what age, but they have no capacity for editing, which means if you say something, it's final truth. If somebody said that to me today, I'd say you're having a bad, bad day. Uh, you know, I can edit that out, but a child cannot do that. And so he, here is a child that takes it as absolute and final truth that he's responsible for all sorrow and pain, the bringer of pain. So he built his life right from the get-go on this lie. And the lie clung to him. It was, it was like creeping ivy all over his life. It's clinging to him. But I say again, it is the lie, because he's not sorrow. That's not his destiny, and he's not responsible for his mother's sorrow or the sorrow of the family. He's not responsible. The tragedy is no one told him that. So he enters life and begins to go into life without any voice of sanity or truth. All he's left with is his inheritance, the name. You see, if the father had been there, or if he'd had a voice to speak, that wouldn't have happened. See, this happened once before. And I don't know if you remember, uh, Rachel, the, the favorite wife um, of Jacob. And do you remember she had her first son, Joseph? But when the second son was born, it was similar. It was great pain, and out of the pain, she's dying. And in her death, she names the newborn baby. And she calls the baby Benoni, which means son of my sorrow. Jacob, you don't mess with Jacob. He stepped in and says, no way, lady, no way. He said, he's not the son of my sorrow. He is Benjamin. And Benjamin means son of my right hand. Well, good for him. Um, but in this case, Jabez and either the father just nodded his head or he wasn't there. I don't know. But there's nobody there. In fact, the only people there affirmed him in his misery. And uh, you, you might notice that when someone's got a problem, he's usually, you know, he's excluded from the tribe. He's got the problem. And, and we affirm it, he's got the problem. So he's imprisoned in his name. Oh, from his earliest memories, he totally believes the lie of his name. It becomes his identity. This is who I am. He's crippled by his own self-image, his own identity. And he's crippled socially. And of course, being in that time and culture, he subconsciously seeks to fulfill his name. This is who I am. So a dark energy surrounds this boy. Dark energy. But of course, again, being that culture, he believed that God placed this terrible destiny upon him. Because again, it's a fact. We gather our first understanding of God. We get that from our parents. Um, it's something, whenever I have preached on, on God the Father, and especially when I point out that Jesus called him Abba, which is linked to Daddy, um, I have at least five to ten people come out of the congregation and say that, you, you, you know, I, I had a father who was a beast and a molester and a beater. You, now you tell me God is my father? Because they had linked their father to God the Father. No wonder Jesus said, no one comes to the Father but by me, never by your own Father. It's always by Jesus. He's the revealer. But, of course, we're talking Old Testament culture. And so he gathered his understanding of God 
naturally from his mother and especially from this name. We, we discover as little children our place in the world by what parents tell us and what the, our peers tell us. And, and it isn't only the world view of our parents. That can be bad enough. But, and I've got to emphasize it, the religion of our parents can give us a legacy of pain. Much depression and darkness in the world has a religious background. Um, gets it all from, from parents that passed it on. He's a pitiful man. He's got a, a broken past. He's got no hope for the future. There's no meaning to his life. There's no significance except I am a source of pain, a tormented mind that overflows and, and sucks everything he touches into his own darkness. And you know, when you, especially in a more primitive culture, such as this would be, that when trouble happens, when there's a tragedy, all eyes turn to this guy. You know, he's Mr. Trouble among us. He's cursed, and he brings his curse. His existence is a dark omen wherever he's living. And we still do that today, though not quite as primitive. I can hear this poor kid. There's something wrong with me. Can, can, you, can you get into his head as he lays in bed at night? There's something wrong with me. I'm not like others. I'm a sorrow bringer. I cause it. I carry it like a disease. I'm a pain to be around. My destiny is sorrow. It's looking for me. It's going to find me if I don't find it first. It's my life. For me to be alive is to bring sorrow and pain to everybody I meet. I don't know what he looked like. In school, serious, for sure. Sad. There's no joy. He's a boy depressed with dark thoughts. And that comes out in rebellion and anger at the darkness he's trapped and can't get out of. You see, my name gives me my self-image after a while here in the West. We take time. But throughout Scripture, your name is your self-image. And... This boy has a self-image, the who am I? It, it's the basic building block of our imaginations that produces behavior. I, 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 say, I don't know what this kid was like. But of course, part of that, I said religion, especially in the Hebrew culture, he's angry with God. I'm sure he would be. If you love me, why did you make me like this? Think about that. Think about how many times that comes into our own heads. If you, if you love me, if you love me, if you love me, why this, why that? If you love me, how come you make me like this? You made me, and in making me, made it sure that I'd never be happy and only bring sadness. But you know... God didn't curse him. This was in God. It, it all grew from his mother's imprint of the lie upon his soul. Think about that. The seed that she planted produces a deadly harvest of lies. You've got to get used to this. There's too many times we think God does this and God does that. No, the curse is not passed on with bad genes. The curse is not because some passing demon out of a job came, came and decided on you. 
The curse is on words that are spoken over us. And then the words that we speak to ourselves. And many of those words are never heard by anybody else. We make sure that we put our self-loathing into silent words inside. And our words is where we have our belief and all our expectancies of life. You, you've read John, James chapter 3, where he said, Our words can govern our entire body. You ever read James 3? You should memorize it. He says, The words that we speak govern our entire body the same as a bit in a horse's mouth or the rudder on the back of a boat. It's so small, you just pass it up, but it governs where the boat's going. And he says, your words, your words. And I say again, words that we speak and words that we say to ourselves. Here he is. This isn't God's fault. Don't blame God. This is a very sick lady who passed her darkness onto her child. Okay, I've been talking about the Hebrew culture. Uh, now let's get real. <laughs> we do exactly the same thing. Um, the name that we have is our legal name. And essentially, forget that. That's not how you were named. That was the name that you went to school with. It's the name they put on the birth certificate. And No. Parents in the West today, authority figures, name children out of their own broken lives. And they pass on the baton of failure. And we, I said it before, you know, you got shame. Are you ashamed? Oh, pass it on. Make somebody else laugh at them, sneer at them, be sarcastic. Pass it on. And, and in so doing, you think you get rid of it. Have you noticed that? A person full of shame is the first one to pass it on to somebody else. But it's always the way. This mother couldn't handle her pain. What should we do with it? Pass it on. Let somebody else get the baton. And I don't know, because I'm, I'm speaking to a lot of people right now, not just you here, but all you up there in Zoom. And then tomorrow night, when a thousand or so people will be listening to this. Um, there's a lot of people right now that I'm challenging were you named as you were growing up you're no good i know many you never do anything right ever heard that one and you will never amount to anything don't kid yourself who do you think you are for having dreams like that Sit down at the table and remember which family you belong to. You are not pretty like your sister. Yeah. Your brother's got all the brains. Where were you when they were handed out? Sorry, but you're just the dumb, stupid one in this family. You are the loser. I'm not making this up. Every one of these things, I've heard it, or people have come in despair telling me this is who I am. I've heard this. When I was in Brooklyn, one of those who we could never, never get through to him. He just didn't get it. And one day, he wore a shirt without sleeves, and tattooed right there on his arm was... I am a loser. And I said, where'd you get that from? He said, my mother put it there. This is real. This is real. Fathers. Again, I've been here and seen it and heard it. Fathers that teach their sons what a real man is. 
to be angry, demanding, foul-mouthed, lazy. You're a man now. You can read the porn. You're a man. Drink the liquor. Go out with the whores. You're a man. It's imprinted into their life. They're named. I was in West Virginia, and I maybe I shouldn't say where I was, but I was down there in West Virginia and Southern Virginia. I have never seen anything like it. Never. Family after family after family. Generations of welfare. And there was a teacher who came down from the north to teach. And she told me, she said, I, I always get to know my, my students and their hopes and their dreams. And she says, I asked my class of five-year-olds, what do you want to do when you grow up? Instant reply, I want to be like my mother and be on welfare. And he's already named a welfare case. And we are poor, not like the crooked rich. You never heard this? Maybe Banderas... Uh, Insulated place. I remember sitting at the table when I was growing up and hearing my parents, good parents, but they were in one mindset. And when I suggested the possibility that one day I'd drive a car, they said, that's not for the likes of us. We've never driven a car in this family and you will never drive a car. Who do you think you are? Obviously, this is not for the folks that are here. I, I, were, I was in class in, in, in school, and I'd fouled up on my mass homework. And the teacher took it, threw it in the garbage can, and he said, Smith, you're stupid, and you will never understand math. I'm 84, and I don't understand math. <laughs> sexually molested and immediately the voice in says you're dirty you're unclean you're a leper and at least until very recently you were a girl molested what were you told you were a whore yeah. you asked for it i could keep on going and god forbid you went to church the first words out of their mouth was, you're unworthy, you're no good. Who saved a wretch like me? And this kind of thing that we're raised with, we snuggle down in wretch, unworthy, with no hope of ever being the beloved of God. And of course, it's in the scripture. Not only what I'm talking about, but don't you remember in Peter, he says, your futile way of life that you inherited from your fathers. Futile. It means I don't know who I am, where I am, why I am. I'm going in endless circles. That's the meaning of futility. The message says, your futile way of life in which you were brought up. Wow. Jabez would have been lost in history. He really would. He didn't stand a chance. Sometimes Cheryl has told me of her conversations with persons there in jail. I'm thinking of one right now. At eight years old, her mother put her out for prostitution. At 11 year old, she's introduced to cocaine by her mother. And you look and you say, what chance do they stand? They have been named. They've been put into a vice. They're in prison. How long before they got to prison? Jabez would have gone the same way. But the final word was he was more honorable than his brothers. 
and he ended up imprinting history. So what happened? One day he heard the truth, the real truth, a revelation of the true God into this profound darkness that he's inherited. And the revelation of truth exposed and disposed of the lies that had come from his mother. His eyes were opened, it says, to the God of Israel. That means in plain English, the God who was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Or to expand on it, it means the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It, it, have you ever read Isaiah 43? It, it should be on your wall somewhere. Let me read from my regular translation. But now thus says the Lord your Creator, He who formed you, do not fear. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you'll not be scorched, nor the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored and I love you, do not fear, for I am with you. And at the end of that passage, God speaks more or less to himself. He says, everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even who I have made. The message, um, and I'll read pieces of that translation as it brings it up to date. The God who made you in the first place, the one who got you started, says, don't be afraid. I've redeemed you. I've called your name. You're mine. And then he says, that is how much you mean to me. That's how much I love you. I'd sell off the whole world to get you back. I'd trade the creation just for you. So don't be afraid. I'm with you. I want them all back, he said. Every last one who bears my name, every man, woman, and child whom I created for my glory, yes, personally formed and made each one. <laughs> Do you realize what I've just read? God said to Jabez, I know your name. Uh, Jabez woke up to realize he had another name. Not Jabez. Another name, not the one his mother gave him. The name that God who created and made him gave him from before birth and could not be changed by parent or religion. I have called you by name. And believe me, God doesn't call anyone by the name of a curse or darkness. He's got his own name for us. The God who named him, blessed him with the blessing of Abraham. God never curses, never demeans, never puts you down. He reveals himself as the God who is love, covenant love, that will never let you go. God of Israel. Israel, you remember that story? Jacob was his first name. Jacob and Jacob's the guy you'd never buy a used car from. <laughs> Jacob the twister. Jacob the manipulator. Jacob. But when God had finished with him, he changed his name to Israel, a prince with God. He's the God of change. Is that why he said the God of Israel? Is it that he saw a God who had named him from before birth with the name of love and hope and direction? And he was a God of change who could take a Jacob and make an Israel. He could take a Jabez and... Oh, God. Now this, I, I don't know whether we've really got time for this, but I've told you before that in the Hebrew language there is no future tense. 
and as much as I say it, people still look at me cross-eyed. How, how can you have a language where there's no future tense? Become an he, uh, Old Testament Hebrew and you'll find out. But it changes. See, when we translated the Old Testament from Hebrew, we corrected the Holy Spirit. Because the whole of the Old Testament is written in the present tense. D did you hear me? The whole of the Old Testament is written in the present tense. There's no future tense. The only time the other, other tense is a past tense that has a, it's affecting my, my present moment. So whichever way you go, it's now. So you see, in, in our Bible, when they translated what we just read, let me refresh you. He says, Jabez called on the God of, oh, that you would bless me indeed. That's not in the scripture. That's what English speaking people believe is common sense. Everybody knows that's how you pray. Would bless me. We know that. And Please enlarge my border, that your hand might be with me, that you would keep me from... We put the whole jolly lot in the future. No, that's not what it says in Hebrew. In Hebrew it says, seeing that you've blessed me. Seeing that you've blessed me, you will enlarge my border. Your hand will be with me and that you will keep me from harm. Do you see what I'm saying? The future tense changes everything. Because I know people that have been praying for the last 40 years, all in the future tense, that God would do this and would do this and would do this, and they're waiting for something to happen. Whereas if I understand the language of God, which he chose as Hebrew, means you have blessed me and all the inheritance you have is mine hold that in mind as you go into this you see this had always been true it's not that one day god says that chap's been talking to me for the last six weeks i better do something <laughs> think about it jabez has been blessed from the womb that is always the case God made a covenant with Abraham and says your seed is blessed and through you all families of the earth shall be blessed. He doesn't have to sit down to consider, well, shall we do that? It's a done deal. Blessed in the womb, not because you've done something, but because God is the God that he really is. And he keeps his word and he's faithful to his word. Jabez has been blessed since the womb, but it has been hidden under a pile of trash, lies, wicked words spoken to him. But now, I don't know how, but it happened one day, the light penetrated the darkness. The light got through the trash pile. And the hearing of faith is awakened. Faith is not something you have to get what you don't have. Faith is that awakening to see what I now do have. And, and, and he woke to realize it. He had been blessed along with Abraham. And so he prayed, not as we Westerners consider prayer, which is always begging, pleading, whining, howling, yowling for something we don't have but he's seen what he's got and he lays hold upon it in this conversation with god because it means quite a few things actually when you think about it he's come to the end of all trust in himself whatever he'd been doing he's come to the point where i can't handle my life anymore it's over I've tried to make sense out of life. I've tried to find meaning and significance and fulfillment. But I now see that all my data that I was working with was a lie. So I give up. I'm not 
I, I can't manage my life, and I now call upon the God who manages and changes people and gives meaning and purpose. He recognized, and this is big, he recognized that the God who spoke to Abraham, the God of Jacob who changed him to Israel, was alive in him right now. Or to put it this way, he, rec he couldn't have prayed that prayer or declared that word of faith unless he understood, hear me, unless he understood God at this micro moment was inside his pain, inside his darkness. God was there loving, desiring, willing to listen to his heart, bring about his deliverance, radically change his situation. Do, do, do you hear what I'm saying? You're, you're not inviting God in because you'll spend the rest of your life wondering if he heard you. Faith is waking up to realize he's there. I meet God in my darkness, the very last place on earth I thought I would. I thought I had to get rid of the darkness so I could meet with God. No, oh, he woke up, God's right here now, in my darkness. And his eyes were open and saw that this real God, God of Israel, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit did not will, it wasn't his will for dark torment. Father, God was the one who sets you free, fills you with light and truth. So therefore, he could boldly make these statements, as we saw last week, for his namesake. Not because of who we are, but because who God is and would never go back on who he is. He sees a God who is woven into my life. He's completely given to me to work out my life in him. Or to put another word, there's no separation. Religion says you've got to do this and got to do this, then God will come. No, this Jabez woke up to realize God's here now, right now. There's no separation. You've got to hope. Because if you talk these words of blessing, you have to disassociate from the lie. You can't think two things at once. Either I think the lie that has a hold of me, or did have a hold of me, or I turn all my attention, hope and trust to the one who is truth. I can't think truth and lie at the same time. You disassociate from the lie, but also disassociate from the one who planted it. Because sometimes you can have a very weird loyalty to a parent who cursed you. And you, you've got to keep believing that, because no, he's got to realize, it goes to the very pit of my being, I'm not responsible for my parents' decisions. I renounce all the lies they told me about God, about myself, and about my destiny. Now, it didn't take me long to say that, but it can take a process because some of these lies are so deep inside of us. It even takes time for the, for the light to, to pull it out and for it to emerge. He's got to choose then to be yielding to the truth. But in those early days, it feels awkward. You know what I mean. I, I, I haven't been living like this. I haven't been thinking like this. I haven't been talking like this. I feel very awkward, especially in the earliest days because it contradicts all that I've ever believed and I'm presently seeing. I don't see much change in my life. But I am anchored now in truth. He faces his mother, who probably isn't there anymore, 
some of the people that hold the biggest hold over us have long passed. But he faces the fact she was wrong. So, so terribly wrong. The source of deadly lies. How do you disassociate from that? You forgive her. And you release her from all the wickedness that she did. Because you see, while you hold bitterness to someone, you are joined to that someone and under their authority. The only way you'll ever be free is to forgive them and to release them and let God do his work. And he had to have done that or he could never have said what he said. He ceases to believe in the limitations of his darkness, all the feelings of his unworthiness. And from the religious belief that, if you understood what I said about names, he had to have it. The religious belief that pain is the will of God. And you know as well as I do, that's a religious belief that holds the Western world. Pain is the will of God. Pain is a gift. Pain is a blessing from God. You know, it, this is my cross to bear. Boy, don't you sound spiritual. It's my cross to bear. That means God, they, they, I'm, I'm supposed to be this way. And I reveal God in my pain. Of course you don't believe that. I remember going to pray for a lady who was sick and she said, you know, don't, don't pray for me, this is the will of God and I'm going to reveal him in, in my sickness. I said, then I, I won't pray for you, but I'm going to take all your medications off the side there to help you fulfill the will of God. It was stupid. We, we'd take medications, but we don't want prayer. Because we've decided God wills my sickness. I'll take medications to try and short circuit him, but can't ask him for anything. No. What he saw in the goodness of God and the covenant love of God was the end of all passivity. He's no longer, this is inevitable. This is my lot in life. This is my destiny. When you say God is the God of covenant love, nothing is inevitable. You've come, you've come into a world where there's no, you're not boxed in. Tomorrow is not what you're living in now. You're, you're moving out. Caesar, it's time to expand. Get outside his box, his pain box. And as soon as he saw this, he made these statements. He didn't have to wait. The covenant has been made. I was in Abraham when it was made. There's nothing more to do except accept my acceptance. It's not a casual, thoughtless prayer. It's an intention engraved in his history and reaching to the very heart of God. He's connecting with the divine imagination, the divine longing, the divine desire. So he doesn't whine as somebody unworthy. Without confusion, he just simply states the facts. I'm blessed. And if I'm blessed, then you are now enlarging me. If I'm blessed, you are now keeping me. Oh. But it's not only free from pain. You can be free from pain and going nowhere. Salvation is not free from the negative. That, that's a Western religious idea. Um, what salvation? God takes my sin. Well, how negative can you be? That's not salvation. Salvation is not from something. Salvation is to something. 
So yeah, he's delivered me from sin, but that's well, where you're going. That's, you know, it, it, today is Pentecost Sunday in, in the ancient church, and um, probably the right Sunday too. Because we know when Jesus died, and this was 50 days later. Uh, so many believers don't really believe in the Holy Spirit. Not really. In fact, many are scared spitless of the Holy Spirit. He's a vague blur. And you never know what he's going to do next. But the fact is, there is no salvation without the Holy Spirit. If the blood of Jesus cleanses from sin, it's the Holy Spirit who comes within us and works out that salvation. And so he doesn't just say, you know, deliver me from evil, got that over with. <laughs> you can be free from pain, I suppose, um, without anything replacing that. But, but you're more like a Halloween pumpkin. You know, there's nothing inside you. You're, you're just a hollow shell. You got the pain out, but there's nothing left. There's got to be the blessing that's replaced the pain. The blessing replaces the curse. And we're only biblically free when we have moved to the blessing. And he cried, as I said, oh, bless me indeed. But really, you have blessed me indeed. No. There's always, do you remember I said the other day, the sinner's prayer should be wow. And, and, and that's, that's always, oh, bless me indeed. Really, oh, you've blessed me indeed. It's, yeah. The blessing of the Lord makes rich, but adds no sorrow. There's no Jabez in blessing. Blessing is the opposite of Jabez. And it was entwined with, with peace. You, if you get into definitions of words, um, the word blessing overlaps peace. And when, when you are blessed of God, you come to that other Hebrew word that you know, I'm sure, shalom, which we have translated as peace. That's a very poor word. Very, it's maybe perhaps one meaning of the word, um, but even then you'll have to understand what they meant by peace. No, shalom. It's a word that deals with your innermost spirit, your mind, your emotions, and every cell of your body, shalom. It meant relationship. If, if um, do you remember in the prodigal son when the elder brother comes back and said to the servant, well, "What's going on?" And, and in our Bibles it says that your brother has returned, and your father has received him safe and sound. That's not what he said. What it says is, your brother has returned and your father has shalom. It means two opposites have come together and they're locked together. Shalom. Um, in the mirror translation, he translates it or at least comments on it as um, a dove joint where, where two pieces of wood are put together in a way that cannot be broken. Shalom, relationship. A relationship that you've realized with God and begin to realize with everyone else. Wherever he'd gone was pain. Now wherever he goes is shalom. The word shalom means well-being. That's a... Ah, it's contentment. Something very few people know about. It is soundness of mind. It's a harmony of your total person. It's a wholeness. 
to your innermost being and to every cell in your body, health and safety and prosperity. Shalom. And deep inside the word shalom is permanence. See, our word joy and our word peace means if the circumstances are right, which means they're very fragile words, you'd hardly... But this is permanent. You don't lose it because it's anchored in the God of covenant, not in you, not in your circumstances. God gives us this. And, and it's not, how can I put this? It is not just a vague, abstract thing. Um, peace, shalom, is the being of God. New Testament says the peace of God, which is how Paul said shalom in Greek. It's peace of God. That is, it is the very presence of God, the Holy Spirit, who is actually imparting himself into my spirit, my mind, my emotions, my body, my relationships. It's the movement of God toward us, restoring everything that was lost. Lost yesterday, lost years ago. He heals the pain of broken lives. And it all came to a head in Jesus, of course. When he was born, they said, Shalom on earth. Peace on earth. God became human. He wasn't God handing out goodies. God became human. He came inside our darkness and he deals with it. And how does he deal with it? We, we sometimes are very short on telling what Jesus did. You say he died for my sins. Yeah, he did. But the Bible says a lot more than that. It says he became cursed for us. That's massive. But in Isaiah, it says he bore our grief and carried our sorrow. And those words in Hebrew are intense. It means grief that covers every possible form of human grief. And sickness is a physical thing as well as mental and emotional. And sorrow is almost the same word, but it, 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 the, the loss, it means this terrible anguish. Jesus did not only become sin, he did not only become the curse, but he carried to finality every grief and sorrow it is possible for the human to know. Out of that comes that terrible primal scream of Jesus, my God, why have you forsaken me? Not that the Father had, but that's what he was feeling right then as he became our curse, as he became our grief and our sorrow as his blood redeemed us from the futile way we learned from our parents. Shalom. He calls us his sheep. And he says, I call my sheep. They know when I call them. Make sure that you know the name he gives you. And only answer that name. This is plenty of other false shepherds calling you by another name. Your name? Where should we begin? You are a child of God. And don't say that too quickly. It means that you are a participant in the divine nature. It means that Christ who rose from the dead and ascended, now actually dwells within you by his Spirit. 
you are the beloved of God. Your name is joy of the Lord. You are shalom. You are the light of the world in Christ, the light of the world. I could keep going. We don't have time. You are the righteousness of God. You are worthy of every promise in him. You are a curse breaker and a blessing bringer. Huh. Yeah. They still called him Jabez, which is, that's interesting. As I said, they usually change the names. But this he didn't. They kept on calling him. He kept on, he kept the name Jabez. Um, but he lived, and this I think is the most important, he lived in contradiction of his name. He still carried Jabez, but everything he did and said and lived was contradicting. And so, you are blessed. You're being given the name by which he calls you. You are a contradiction of everything that you might have been shaped as. In fact, you've come now into the gravity of God. Human earthbound gravity sucks you down. That's gravity. It sucks you. It holds you on the earth. God's gravity pulls you up and seats you in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And you are more honorable than your brethren. Amen. Father, we thank you for the absolute, the final truth of who you are and that you blessedly, so gently, kindly invade our lives, invade our darkness, and you turn us into new people in Christ Jesus. Open our eyes to see who we truly are. Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.